peace and justice opening structural is starting right now. So I'm going to read um, and I'm going to go. Anybody who wants to come can. Uh, I, I think it sucks that they scheduled that right at the same time. But um, yeah, it should be cool. It's in Springville, so I'm driving to Denver and listening. Um, all right. So um, I'm not sure about the title, and uh, this is only the first half of Trotsky's life. I'm going to. Uh, I, I think I'm going to uh, do the second half sometime. Um, right. Throughout the 60 years of life, Leon Trotsky, born Levin Davidovich Bronstein, went from being the son of a farmer to being a leader of one of, most, one of the most pivotal revolutions in human history. Leon was born on November 7, 1879, in the village of Yanovka in Kyrgyzstan province. While at the time this would have been part of the Russian Empire, it's now in the southeast of modern day Ukraine. While Leon was certainly not born into the upper class, his father wasn't a peasant either. Ironically, this made the future revolutionary a member of the bourgeoisie. Because of his position in society, it's a common belief that there was a feeling of guilt about his relative good fortune that launched his revolutionary ideology. But it seems to me that the reasons behind his actions are a little more complex than guilt or the implied teen angst. It was actually my repulsion to such a simplistic ex explanation of Trotsky's motivations that made me want to outline his complex and self-questioning character, which makes such an explanation untenable. While, this, while the unknown variables that affected the character of Leon Trotsky are so innumerable that it would be irresponsible for me to make any conclusions about the actual reasons behind his chosen path, the decisions he ultimately made provide evidence of his fundamental ideologies which provide an unquestionable evidence of absence concerning the aforementioned assumptions. In 1888, the young boy was sent to live in Odessa on the coast of Ukraine with his mother's nephew, who along with his wife agreed to look after Leon's education. Eight years later, in 1896, the young man left Odessa for the seaport of Nikolaev, where he was to finish high school. Once in Nikolaev, it was through his association with the Czech gardener that Leon adopted neurotonism and began began actively debating the merits of populist socialism. In these early days, Leon was vehemently against the ideas of Marxism. More specifically, he was convinced that Marxism would make individuals prisoners of social and economic circumstance, the very idea of which repulsed the young romantic, who found purpose in principles of heroism and self-sacrifice that, in his mind, were contradicted by the dryness of Marxism. By 1897, Leon had gotten involved with the formation of the South Russian Workers' as a Union, which was organized in the factory and dock workers of Nikolaev and the surrounding towns. On 28 January 1898, police agents penetrated the Union and arrested several people, including Leon. Temporarily held in Nikolaev prison, Leon was transport, transported to Kyrgyzstan prison and eventually arrived at a prison in Odessa. Whether it was the hardening effect of prison or simply an intellectual revelation, it was during this time of isolation that Leon left his neurotic, neurotic sympathies behind and converted to Marxism. In November of 1899, Leon was sentenced to four years in exile. He ended up spending five months in Moscow transfer prison where he married his fellow revolutionary, Alexandra Lvovna Sokolovskaya. After the few months, of transfer between Moscow and Irkutsk, Leon and his new bride were settled in the gold mining village of Lyskut in eastern Siberia. Leon spent his time in exile absorbing literature and writing pieces for the local newspaper. It was at this time that his writing became oddly prolific, earning him the nickname The Pen. In 1902, Leon received word that a few of his pieces had reached the social democratic paper Iskara, edited by Vladimir Lenin, making a good impression. Convinced that opportunities were awaiting him in the West, Leon began planning his escape from exile. In the summer of 1902, he left Alexandra and his two daughters in Uskut, traveling to Irkutsk, hidden in a hay cart. While in Irkutsk, Leon was given a passport in which he used the name Trotsky for the first time. With the final destination of London, Trotsky made his way to Samara and crossed into Austria illegally. He was able to help to find help in Vienna from the founder of Austrian Social Democratic Party. Uh, oh, from the founder of the Austrian Social Democratic Party, Victor Adler, which was which allowed him to make the final trip to London. In October 1902, Trotsky had his first meeting with Lenin and 
went on within a month, he had published his first article in Istra. His time in London only lasted a few months, after which he was living in Paris. In March of 1903, at the suggestion of Lenin, the 24-year-old Trotsky was voted onto Istra's editorial board, sealing his position among the socialist intelligentsia. There were fundamental differences in the ideologies of Russian socialists, and these differences were nowhere more apparent than in the members of Iskra's board of editors. The first Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party took place in March 1898, but had no lasting effect. However, in the summer of 1903, Lenin and the other editors of Iskra convened the second Congress in London. It was at this particular Congress that the, form, that the aforementioned differences were truly documented. When the delegates began discussing the party statutes, it was the first point of discussion that opened up a vehement debate. At first glance, the two sides of the propositions seemed indistinguishable. Lenin's side wanted all members of the party to provide both material support and personal participation to the party, while Martov argued that they should only require what he called personal cooperation. This difference in terminology demonstrated the different approaches the two sides had towards the idea of membership. One side felt that the party should be small and centralized yet devoted, while the other felt that strength would come with the quantity rather than the quality of members. Interestingly enough, Trotsky decided to side with Martov on this particular issue instead of his good friend and mentor. The exact reasons Trotsky had for opposing Lenin's position are complicated, but the following excerpt from Wistrich's biography of Trotsky which is a direct quote from a copy of Proceedings of the Second Conference sheds light on the situation. This is Trotsky. I do not give the statutes any sort of mystical interpretation. Lenin's formula should be rejected. It defeats its own purpose. It will make it far more difficult for workers to join the party than for the intelligentsia, since organizations of workers are subjected to more pressures and break down more easily. For instance, through strikes. These disagreements led to the formation of two distinct factions of the Russian revolutionary movement. The side that followed Martov would become known as the Mensheviks, while those who followed Lenin were the Bolsheviks. This difference of opinion concerning membership would eventually evolve into a much greater difference in ideology. Oxford's Russia, a history, defines Mensheviks as Mar Marxists who did not believe Russia ready for proletarian or socialist revolution. Mensheviks were following the log logic of orthodox Marxism. This contrasts the Bolsheviks, who are prepared to skip the stage of giving power over to the capitalists, thereby proceeding directly to a socialist state. It was in 1905 that Trotsky returned to Russia, and it was no coincidence that his return coincided with an attempted revolution. Once the general strike broke out in October, Trotsky returned to St. Petersburg, where he immediately jumped into a high-ranking position in St. Petersburg Council of Workers Deputies, also known as the Soviet. It was that same month that Nicholas II issued his manifesto promise, promising constitutional rights. While Trotsky was enthusiastic about the promises made in the manifesto, he considered it to be nothing but a temporary victory and felt that the imperialists would never hold up their end of the bargain unless they had no other choice. The Soviet decided to call upon the population to stop paying taxes until the promises made in the manifesto had actually manifested. This new strategy was met with a quick show of force, force in which the government arrested the entire Soviet leadership on December 3rd. Trotsky was once again in prison, this time from December 1905 to January 1907, a total of 12 months. At the end of the 12 months, Trotsky and 13 other members of the Soviet received a sentence of exile to the Siberian village of Obdorska, above the Arctic Circle. According to Volk Godnov, this small village was some 600 miles from the nearest railway station and more than 500 from a telegraph point. Despite this dreary sentence, Trotsky had no intention of being cut off from his comrades or the ability to have his words published forever, for very long, if at all. Despite the presence of 50 armed cavalrymen escorting the 14 revolutionaries, Trotsky made escaping look easy by faking an attack of sciatica at the town of Berezov. Trotsky was left behind with only two guards while the portage continued on its way. With the help of a local peasant, Trotsky made his escape across the tundra. After an incredible 500-mile trek accomplished with the help of some tribesmen who sold him food and a sleigh, Trotsky was able to reach the Urals. From here, Trotsky returned to St. Petersburg, where he was able to flee the country entirely to Finland. In 
1907, Trotsky had a second family, including his wife, Sedova, and their two sons, Levin and Sergei, born in 1906 and 1908, respectively, settled down in Vienna. Trotsky continued to write under assumed pen names, making enough money to live comfortably in a modest three-room apartment. From September 1912 to the following year, Trotsky covered the Balkan Wars, writing over 70 articles for Kievske uh, Mizel. In 1913, Trotsky returned to Austria, where his family awaited him. But on, second, on August 2nd, 1914, after receiving a tip from Austria's chief of pol political police that Austrian authorities were going to make arrest, arrests, Trotsky fled with his family to Switzerland. Within two months of being in Switzerland, Trotsky was once again received an offer from Kievska Mizel to cover the First World War from Paris, which he accepted. His stay in France lasted a couple, a couple of years, but on October 30th, 30th, 1916, he was ordered to leave France, presumably for his revolutionary writings, and was escorted to the Spanish border by two armed escorts. Once in Spain, the Madrid police arrested Trotsky as a known anarchist. I have found that out. After several weeks in prison, Trotsky was able to arrange for a deal, which pleased, placed him and his family on board a ship bound for the United States. Once in New York, Trotsky began giving lectures and meeting with fellow revolutionaries, but this would only last a few months until unexpected news started coming out of, coming out of St. Petersburg, or rather the newly named Petrograd. In 1917, at the behest of the people, that had been strained by many years of war and an imminent food shortage. At, excuse me. Strained by many years of war and imminent food shortages, as pointed out in Hoskins, Russia, and the Russians, 300 years of the Romanov dynasty were, was now over. In its place rose a provisional government which was not necessarily sympathetic to Lenin and his fellow Bolsheviks, who were demanding a complete withdrawal from the war along with other drastic social changes. Once Trotsky had received word of the February Revolution, he, along with his family and some other Russians, boarded a ship on March 27th, heading to Europe. Before the ship could start out across the Atlantic, it was searched at the Canadian port of Halifax, where Trotsky and the group of Russians, including his family, were arrested. This arrest was only temporary, seeing as how the provisional government received a great deal of pressure from the revolutionaries and their newspapers, such as the Bolsheviks' Pravda, contact Halifax and request the release of Trotsky and his companions. Within three weeks of his departure, Trotsky was in Petrograd, but as of yet undecided which political party he was going to ally himself with. It wasn't until the provisional government started going after Lenin that in a burst of solidarity, Trotsky's fate became sealed with that of the Bolsheviks. A quote from an open letter written by Trotsky published in the Sochinia which is quoted in Volker Gonov's Trotsky, the Eternal Revolutionary, demonstrates his amazing commitment to the cause. Citizen ministers, I know you have decided to arrest comrades Lenin, Zinoviev, and Kemenev, but the arrest order does not include me. Therefore, I think it is essential to draw your attention to the following facts. One, in principle, I share the views of Lenin, Zinoviev, and Kemenev, and I defend them in my newspaper, Vipper, and in my many public speeches. Two. My position on the events of 3rd to 4th July coincides with those of the above mentioned comrades. It's Trotsky, 1917. These actions had their consequences, seeing as how Trotsky was arrested a week and a half later. But since the government could find no serious grounds for his arrest, he was released on September 2nd. Only a month went by before the October Revolution was in full swing, at which time both Trotsky and Lenin hope, Lenin's hopes for a revolution had been reached. This is only a picture of the first half of Trotsky's life, but I believe it successfully demonstrates how absolutely devoted Trotsky was to the cause of overthrowing the empire. From being a neurotic to becoming a Marxist, Trotsky never stopped questioning his own logic and was not afraid to switch positions when he felt he had been proven wrong. This is not the mentality of someone acting out of teen angst. From being a Menshevik to becoming a Bolshevik, Trotsky stayed the course of his convictions, only altering, of course, when it became obvious that to do so threatened the progression of the revolution. Despite having seen the realities of prison, Trotsky was not intimidated into abandoning the cause. Whether Trotsky was right or wrong, he was not driven by greed or ignorance. Rather, he was driven by the needs of the proletariat and a fundamental philosophy based on justice. This leaves one question, which is, how could this young idealist 
ever justify the means by which the ultimate revolution would be won? The answer to this came in the form of the following quote from his book, Our Morals and Theirs. A means can be justified only by its end, but the end in turn needs to be justified. Lev Davidovich Bronson. Thank you.